George Wickham was found by a freshman of no real importance on the campus square, tied up, spread eagle, hungover, and, it must be noted, completely naked. While there are many at Austin University who felt the punishment fit the crime, there were also those who failed to see the poetic justice, among them naturally Wickham himself, along with the Austin University administration, including President DeBerg. And, as it was rapidly becoming clear to Elizabeth Bennett, as she sat in the waiting room outside her office door, whatever President DeBerg thought, so too thought her office assistant, Mr. Collins. You've made us quite upset, Miss Bennett, Collins informed her, glaring across his desk, quite upset. Along with having his lips permanently attached to President DeBerg's ass, Mr. Collins was, unfortunately, Lizzie's first cousin once removed. Up until recently, this relation had not seemed quite so unlucky since it was at Mr. Collins' encouragement that Lizzie had applied to Austin University and gotten a full tuition scholarship for academic achievement. Coming from a family with five daughters, Lizzie knew this was no small financial feat, and thus managed to hold her tongue at her distant cousin's strange habit of insisting on being called Mr. Collins, even by his relatives. Observing this sycophantic behavior in her cousin, however, Lizzie felt a twinge of worry about her genetic makeup. She'd already had her concerns from her mother's side, but now she had to worry about what unpleasant dormant lurkers might be hiding on her father's side, too. I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Collins, Lizzie told him evenly, and could not help herself from adding, quite sorry. Collins' face furrowed with the effort of determining if he was being apologized to or mocked. Fortunately, before any permanent wrinkles could be fixed in place, the intercom buzzed, and President DeBerg's imperious voice snipped over the speaker. Is she here? I'll bring her straight in. With that, Collins opened the office door and glared Lizzie into entering. With her southern flair for the dramatics, President DeBerg had kept the back of her office chair turned toward the door, waiting for Mr. Collins to come to stand behind the desk with an outraged glower, before slowly turning to face Lizzie. Karen de Berg was precisely the sort of woman who looked as though she would never die, which is to say she had the appearance of a hearty tangerine left out in the sun for just a bit too long. Her hair was dyed a deep black, which nobody had believed to be her natural hair color for at least the last 20 years, and it was styled in a gravity-defying bouffant that betrayed her age more than any greys could. She had a penchant for wearing bright colored shirts and distinctive pieces of jewelry, the bigger the better that was perhaps matched only by her love of pralines, of which she always had a tin on hand. Elizabeth Bennett, she drawled in her distinctly Charleston accent. Take a seat. Lizzie did so, careful to keep her back straight and to only cross her legs at the ankles. These old Southern women had eyes like hawks and took any sign of comfort or familiarity as an indication of bad moral character. I suppose you know why you're here? I'm assuming it's because of my article. If you can even call it that. Mr. Collins's own fairly mild accent always became much more pronounced in his boss's presence. President de Berg retrieved the offending article from the Juvenilia, the weekly university publication, and placed it squarely in the middle of her desk. Would you care to explain to me what this is? Lizzie observed where President de Berg's finger had landed. I believe that's a penis, President de Berg. A pixelated penis, but still it took a full minute for the furor to die down, with President DeBerg alternating between loudly condemning Lizzie's forward Yankee ways and Mr. Collins following his boss in an awkward echo as he hurried to repeat everything DeBerg said and match her ire for ire. Lizzie waited for the commotion to die down before supplying, I suppose you were referring to the article itself. It would have been strange if the school paper didn't cover the incident. Wickham's public display had been huge news across campus, after all, and hard to miss with so many people posting pictures before security was able to cut him loose. We made it very clear to your faculty chair that nothing about the incident was meant to be broadcast through school media. Professor Palmer led me to understand that you were instructed not to write the article, but printed it anyway. Lizzie raised an eyebrow. I was advised not to, but instructed? That sounds an awful lot like censorship. Your point being? Propriety be damned. Lizzie crossed her legs, taking pleasure in the little hitch of distaste on President de Berg's upper lip. Look, the article is out there. Can't undo it. No use crying over spilt milk or loose nuts, as the case may be. She'd hoped the phrasing might incur another outcry of moral outrage, but instead President de Berg glared at her. Not so much a glare of dislike, although the emotion in question was certainly present in that steely blue gaze 
but one of calculation. You're awfully self-assured for someone so young. Pray tell, how does someone of your age get to be quite so confident? Pray tell, Collins echoed with a sneer, until President de Berg waved a hand in his direction and he all but clapped his hand over his mouth, mortified at having spoken out of turn. This felt like a trap. Lizzie tread carefully. I don't know, I mean, I always eat my Wheaties. Alas, de Berg did not crack even the smallest of smiles. Tell us, Miss Know-it-all Bennett, what should the administration do, rather than, as you put it, cry over spilt milk? Well, I guess I'd put my effort toward trying to find out whoever tied Wickham up in the first place. Somehow, and Lizzie did not quite know how, she had stepped onto a hidden landmine. President de Berg smiled. Marvelous plan, don't you think, Mr. Collins? Even Mr. Collins seemed a bit taken aback by her abrupt shift in mood, and had to double-check President de Berg's expression before parroting, Marvelous. Great. I'm glad that's settled. Lizzie rose to her feet, hoping a hasty exit might save her from whatever unpleasantness was bound to follow. President de Berg's voice reached her before she managed to make it out the door. You'll let us know, won't you? As soon as you figure it out. As soon as I figure it out? Lizzie was beginning to understand Mr. Collins's propensity for echoing. President de Berg's smile was a full-on cat that ate the canary grin now. Very generous of you to volunteer to discover who tied George Wickham up on the campus square. Of course, as this is a time-sensitive issue, we'll need an answer by a week from today. Or we'll have to assume that you, as a person with vested interest in seeing Mr. Wickham publicly humiliated, are the culprit. And what do you think the punishment for such a crime should be, Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins looked thrilled, and maybe even a little aroused at the sudden power that had been placed into his hands. Suspension? For an infraction this significant, Mr. Collins? I'd hate to think you'd gone soft. He was practically quivering now with the ecstasy of it. Expulsion. Yes, Mr. Collins, I believe that would be the most fitting solution. Lizzie kept her face perfectly composed, not wanting to give either the satisfaction of seeing her panic. And most certainly, it would be satisfaction that these two sadists would feel at the thought of seeing her squirm. Then I suppose I'll see you in a week. And it wasn't until she was safely in the windowless stairwell that Lizzie let herself collapse against the wall, sliding down to sit on one of the steps. Well, shit.